Today, I'm gonna be showing you guys how I recreated the song Sneakers by Knox. This thing blew up all over TikTok, and like everyone else, I'm completely obsessed with this song. Not to the point where I like make up a dance for it, but like just a step below that of recreating the whole song from scratch. I'm gonna show you guys how I do a drum-centered mix. We're gonna get into a lot of EQ stuff, my approach for plug-in basses, how to get a giant wall of mid-range with guitars without it completely taking over the mix. But before I jump into all that, let me introduce myself. My name is Seth. I work as a guitar-based pop producer out of Seattle, Washington. Washington. I do one of these videos every week to show people how to produce their own pop music at home. Songs I've either written or produced have been featured on these Spotify curated playlists and I did an entire album through Warner Music Group. So if we watch through this video and you think that we might be a good fit for a project, or if you just have some production stuff that you want to offload onto somebody else so you can just focus on being a songwriter, check out the top link in my description. All right, on to the rest of the video. So a majority of this beat is actually based around this, which is the Luke Holland kit from Mixwave. I'm not sponsored by them at all. I just genuinely like how this drum kit sounds. To me, it really hits that perfect middle ground of a production quality kit that sounds really good if you're just experimenting with writing stuff but it also has enough options to where you can actually like mix with it pretty easily but I started with the just like the record preset I did mess around with the faders a lot I think mainly just trying to tweak the hi-hat kick and snare and then like normal I stemmed out the snare sample and the kick sample so they're on their own separate tracks I'll show you why in a second they're completely turned off though I then threw in a shaker loop with some EQ on it. I don't really like my shakers having a lot of low end. I like the white noise hiss that they create and that's essentially it. And all of those guys are going into one group where we are doing some bus processing. So I got kind of tired of using Waves Kramer tape, which if you've watched my channel, you know I use a lot. So I wanted to see if I could get that sort of distorted sound slash tone control. And I think I found my new favorite, this RC20 preset, basically the stock one that it comes with when you turn it on. Everything turned off except for the distortion and then adjust the tone control and the cuts and then some soothe after the fact to tame the sort of five to six K range. This kit sounds totally fine in that range, but on the original sneaker song, it's a very pop punk driven mix. So the high end isn't super crisp. So here it is without. Sounds awesome. Then when we turn these guys on. And in terms of writing, these drums are really simple. It's the basic pop punk beat that everybody knows. And then I liked how in the original song, they have a fill that goes into a crash on the two of the next bar. And that's the transition for the power hand to move to the crash. Also, another random thing I do with drums is whenever I have a section like this that's pretty heavy on the power hand, I always like to add the step hat on top of that. Just because when I'm drumming, that's something that I do. Not all the time, but it works really well in this scenario. And when whenever you have a beat on a chorus where you're hitting a ride and you want like a little bit more of a girth behind that time, having that step hat underneath it just fills it up a lot. All right, next we have the bass. This looks like a complete mess, but I promise there's a reason for it. So let's just start out from the beginning. I'm using the punk bass from Submission Audio on this first bass channel. I think that it just works really well. Has that almost warp tour style sans amp distorted tone on the DI preset. And since this bass is consistently just playing downstrokes, instead of writing a bunch of like alternating picking notes, I just grabbed an Ableton arpeggiator. And since I'm playing one note at a time, it just kind of keeps repeating it the way that you would normally. As you can see, there's some automation with this guy. So in the intro, it actually doesn't have that arpeggiator on, but that's because I just felt like it was easier to program those hits and I wanted the notes to ring out. But after that, we're going into some CLA bass to sort of shape it a bit. This Quake preset was pretty good. I ended up lowering a lot of the subs though and the cut because it was really aggressive. Some general EQ shaping. It was super low end heavy, so I filtered out a lot. And then the high end was kind of excessively bright. And instead of saturating it, I just decided to cut it with an EQ. And this utility is actually my way of controlling the volume going from section to section. So in the intro, so in the intro is just some police style electric guitars, some modern electronic drum samples and the bass. And the bass doesn't really need to fight that hard to sit on top of that sparse of a mix. So I just lowered it here. This is actually my favorite way of doing volume automation in Ableton just because it's easier to have your regular faders up here free and you don't have to worry about screwing up all your automation or even worse having to select everything and then hold shift and move it up and down like this. I just find this way to be easier. After that, we're doing some sidechain compression, and this is what these snare and kick samples are for. So they're turned on in Ableton, they're just brought all the way down in the mix on the fader. And the reason I'm doing that is because now I can have them as sidechain input sources for these compressors. So as you can see, 
Boom, da. Boom, da. Like you can see the drum beat almost hitting on the meters. And that just creates a really nice separation. It's not too aggressive. They're only doing a few dB of gain reduction. To clean it up a little bit more, I did my normal thing with Soothe. So this is in sidechain mode, set up with that same kick sample. And we're just focusing on this like sub low end where the kick is hitting. And the reason that I'm doing this is because I feel like I don't have to side chain the bass with the kick as much. Like I don't have to compress the volume of it so much when I'm just bringing down this one frequency range. Because that is where a lot of like the frequency masking is happening. And it's based around the specific frequencies of the kick drum. So you can see when the kick hits, when it hits, it will come down and sort of go a little bit down to the side and then back because it's following the natural pitch envelope of when you kick a kick drum. And then on top of that, just because this song is so drum and vocal mix forward, I decided to also do some mirror EQ with the kick and the snare. So all I did was I went to these drum samples, I put an EQ on them and just soloed them, and I just tweaked around to find like that main resonant frequency that they were giving me. Looks like for the kick it was about 56 hertz, and for the snare it was around 200, and I did some light broadband cuts and then I added that EQ to the bass. And what you hear is, when I take all of this stuff off, it doesn't sound bad as a bass, but when I turn it all on, you can hear two things. One, the tonal characteristic is slightly different, specifically in that sub low end. There's a lot of ducking and weaving. And I find that when I'm doing like modern radio pop rock mixes, this is really important for making sure everything gets out of the way of the kick drums. Next are these drums that I added just for the intro. Pretty much all of them were from this Origin Sound Thick Drums pack, which honestly is my favorite pack for this kind of aggressive modern sound cloud trap drum sample sound. This thing is gold. And then a little bit of a cut up Mitch Moolah drum loop for the hi-hats. It looks like there was also a snare built in there. But yeah, just leveling out these snares with some MoTT. And then on the group, using some more MoTT to sort of glue all the drums together dynamically. Using that same distortion trick that I I used on the main drum kit just because I didn't want the beginning drum samples to be super bright in comparison. And then I felt like they were also kind of aggressive in this range. So I used to soothe the sort of tame it out a bit. All right, now we're getting to the part that most people are used to on this channel, the guitars. So there's a lot of guitar layers here. First guitars are these guys in the intro. <laughs> Um, I genuinely love this sound. I grew up listening to The Police, and this is just straight up, for anybody who's ever listened to The Police, this is just straight up Andy Summers. I was just using this Prince in the Rain preset, which looks like it's based around a jazz amp, which is a rolling jazz chorus if you want to look it up in your DAW. And then this ensemble chorus here. I turned off the reverb because I didn't need it. And then I tried out the Ableton Phaser, which I've never used before. It's pretty nice. I might start using it more often now. Just giving it a little bit of a warbliness, and it's great for adding a little bit of a subtle shape, especially if you make it on a slower setting. So what I did was for these two guitars, because they're doubled, I actually changed the rate on one of them. So this bottom one is on two, whatever two stands for, and this one is on one, just so they're not exactly the same. And then I just used a little bit of L1 to tame the level of them. If there's anything that I would recommend pop producers do to their guitars to make them more deliverable, let's say, I would say just throw L1 on something and then just bring it down until it's hitting a decent amount of attenuation. You don't want it to sound super crushed, but yeah, then just copy that over to whatever you have doubled for it. And then when you pan them left and right, they sound very even. After that, I use some MoTT on a pretty aggressive setting, but to counteract that sort of aggressive compression effect, I lowered the lows here. So they sound super consistent and nice. Underneath those guys, we have the acoustics. All the guitars on this track are doubled, by the way. For these acoustics, I used my new Yamaha acoustic with this AKG pencil condenser, the P170. It's basically the only thing I record acoustics with now, for pop stuff at least. Again, for this track, I'm using more of like the pop punk mindset for acoustics, which is completely destroyed. Technically not the right way to record acoustics, but no one cares. This is pop music. If it sounds good, it is good. So this is the chain that I have always used for acoustic guitars. Just a basic EQ to do some tone shaping, control the low end. 
I honestly low pass my acoustics most of the time because I don't need that pure high end that they have. And then a little bit of a cut around that 4K range to get rid of that excessive pick attack. Some very basic compression. Honestly, if you're trying to learn how compression works, I would start with a heavy strummed acoustic guitar because it's really awesome at showing you how a compressor can shape the tone of something. And after we've done some compression, we just have some L1 controlling those peaks. But then on the bus, some Kramer tape to compress them, give them a little bit more saturation and darken that tone a bit more. Some C4 to level out any like weird frequency bumps that happened. Because sometimes when you compress stuff or you saturate stuff a lot, you can get some build up in the low end or the mid range. So it's just controlling those guys. And then I just felt like the low end was still a little bit too boomy after all of that. So I added a high pass here. Now, I haven't talked a lot about the writing of these guitars, and there's there's a very specific reason for that. When you listen to the mix, it's actually kind of hard to tell what the guitars are doing because it's such a vocal and drum heavy mix, which I think stylistically works because Knox is more of a, a modern take on pop punk. But so like when you listen to the original song, it's actually kind of hard to tell how many electric there are. So this is my guesstimate of what they've done. You can hear that they're doing acoustics, which is kind of extending that chord on the upper register. And then we have these guys. Super fuzzy. I used my Ibanez art core for this one because I felt like it needed some humbuckers on it. I tried it with a Strat and it kind of didn't work. Again, I've got a decent approximation to the kind of effect that they have. I don't think that they used this tone specifically, but when I was listening to the guitars, it felt like there was a mid range wash to them and it wasn't really a heavy pick attack sound. And then a little bit of an EQ curve to control the low end. Again, a, that pick attack and low pass it. And then we double tracked them. And so those are the lower rhythms. Also, before I go into, I should mention on the bus with all of these electrics, I have Soothe attenuating that same range, that 4K range. It's just, it's annoying when it builds up. So you got to be careful with it. A lot of Motiti, like a lot. These guys are almost flatlined. Some Kramer tape to darken them up and then some C4 to level them out in the low end in the mid range. So everything you hear in this group is going to have that processing on it. Real quick, I'll show you what it is without it. <laughs> It brightens things up a bit. It does kind of add that like scooped sound to it, but there's enough mid range elements already happening in the track that it kind of doesn't matter. Next up, we have these guys. Basically the exact same sound, but a little bit more drivey. I just felt like there was a higher sort of extension of the chord, but it wasn't like a new chord part. Honestly, the arrangement of these guitars are pretty interesting. If anyone has more information about how they arrange this, let me know, because uh, I'm very interested in how they chose to arrange stuff. And then there's a lead part here. I mean, this one was just straight fun. We got to use the uh, the super heavy amp in Gojira. And again, whenever I use anything that needs an 80s vibe, I almost always use like some kind of Juno chorus. The Arturia one's been the go to. And then whenever I use a guitar solo, I always throw it into some kind of send with a ping pong delay. Dotted eighth notes seem to be the best for this one. And a little bit of ROM reverb. And all of these guitars, all of these guys, all the acoustics, all these guys, everything are in a group that also have that mirror EQ on them, the same one that's on the bass, and they also have those side chain compressors with the kick and the snare. So whenever the kick or the snare hits, the whole mix kind of moves out of the way. And I know that for some people, they're not a fan of that style of a mix, which I totally understand. But for this modern style, that pumpiness that a lot of people don't like, that's kind of the sound of it. So that's everything. Mastering chain real quick. Did my normal EQ curve. If it's blue, then it's cutting on the sides. If it's white, it's just a general cut. Again, did a little bit of a cut near 5K because of the track like this, they build up really quickly. Then I go into my linear phase multiband just because I wanted to catch the snare hits before we went into our next compressor, which is the Slate Virtual Bus Compressor. I did kind of want to compress stuff a bit more than I normally would on a track like this. Using some Fab Filter Saturn. On this track, 
like I actually did use all of these bands. So as you can see, normally the high end and the low end are turned off and it's just the mids. But here I'm actually using a decent amount of them. Using some max bass as some low end enhance. Using the ultra low extender preset on max bass just to extend the low end a bit more. Then we move on to some additive EQ. Again, this is adding on the sides because they're blue. So it looks like in the 200-ish and the 900-ish range and everything above 2K, we're widening the stereo field on that just a tiny bit. And then going into a couple of ozone limiters, I like going into the vintage limiter first and then the maximizer. I think we're hitting around negative 10 LUFS and that's everything. So let me show you what the final track sounds like. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you liked it, hit subscribe, like all those things below. Again, I do one of these videos every week. So if you enjoy guitar based pop content, it's kind of the only thing I'm doing. Also, let me know if you've seen any other TikTok songs that you would like me to cover here, because this stuff is fun and I would love to do more tracks like this. But yeah, I will see you guys next week.